Hello, my name is Guido Strack. I'm chairman of the Whistleblower Network in Germany. I'm also working uh, in the steering committee of the International Whistleblowing Network, which just is in the process of founding. And um, the talk will concentrate Uh, that's my history. I explained it a bit in, in, in the morning in the other presentation. Uh, so I have a background as a whistleblower within the EU Commission. The, uh, the topics I'm trying to deal with is definition and types of whistleblowing, uh, understanding whistleblowers, uh, what kind of people are they, what is, is driving them, uh, then I'm touching the legal uh, protection issue and uh, just telling uh, some facts about whistleblower network. So first, um, definition and types. So what is a whistleblower and what is aiming for? Um, I think a whistleblower is someone who, who notices something going wrong, or which he thinks is going wrong, could be either wrongdoing or a risk he, he wants, to, wants to be tackled. And, and he, he also sees that he is not able to tackle that on his own. So he, he addresses him, himself to someone else, from him, uh, from whom he hopes that uh, this person or organization he, he addresses will be able to change something. So there, there's two typical aims, which is A, to get something changed, to get something hold responsible, someone hold responsible for a wrongdoing, and B, uh, not to be um, uh, ruined or not to be uh, damaged by doing that. So the, the own uh, security aspect, so to say. In a classical definition of whistleblowing, uh, you need to be an organizational member. So not every criti criti uh, everybody criticizing a system uh, or an oppositional party or someone like that would be considered as a whistleblower. But a whistleblower is an insider who has specific information about an organization. So typically, it would be uh, um, a member of the workforce of that organization, so an employee uh, or a public official. But you can see nowadays that this uh, part of the de definition is someone uh, somehow uh, weakening on an issue which is perhaps not always uh, being seen as a part of the definition anymore. So we tend to speak a lot about a lot of people. A lot of people try to claim themselves being whistleblowers without fulfilling this organization member criteria. And it's it's really a question if you should protect only organizational members, and if you should only limit it to employees or workers, and how you define that. So this is a, a, a political and a legal issue as well. Also, the the issue of wrongdoing and risk is not very clear. So. Um, you could start from a very legalistic point, a positivistic point of view, saying it's a breach of law. And uh, from that you could go anywhere. So you could say it's a, it's a breach of law which, which already happened, which would be the most restrictive point of view. You could say it's a breach of law which tends, which is risky to be, to be happening, or a breach of a, of a legally protected uh, value. Which, uh, environment or, or health of human beings, things like that. And you could go up to moral standards. Say it's a violation of moral standards, it's unethical treatment, and I want to blow the whistle on that. And, and the more you go into this moral and future area, uh, the, the, the more difficult it becomes to have a consensus on that. So if you can prove a, a, a breach of law which has been accepted in the past, which lie, and the breach lies in the past, it's much easier to say, uh, oh, there is a big danger that in the future a, a moral standard, which is not clearly defined, uh, will be violated. Um, what you also see, uh, there's a lot of addresses. So in fact, from a factual point of view, it's the whistleblower has the full choice. So at least nowadays, it's quite easy to address anybody in the world with your problem. You could, you could put it on the internet, you could write a blog, you could go, uh, write a parliamentary petition, you could go to public prosecutors, you could go to, to other public authorities, you could go to your immediate boss, you could go to supervisors, to, to boards, whatever. So there's a free choice. Uh, the problem is that this free choice 
is not a legally free choice in most of the uh, legal orders we see nowadays, but then that there are uh, restrictions. And typically the restriction will be uh, at least first to go in, to stay inside your organization. Perhaps even within your organization you might see restrictions that you need to, to, to address the lowest level of hierarchy above you as the first level and then only after they didn't react uh, go up. And uh, the, the other question about the addressee is, uh, whom does it make sense to address? So if we, if we say what a whistleblower aims for is to get the change done or to, to be someone to be held responsible, then you need to address someone who has the power, or from whom you expect at least to have the power and the willingness to, 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 to go for that change, to support you in, in aiming for that change. And the dangers, of course, are different from whom you address. If you only address your direct superior, uh, danger might be lower and that might somehow be expected in your, uh, respected with, within your hierarchy. If he tells you to, to, to shut up and you shut up, uh, at least, then uh, the, the story might go, be over without you being hurt. If you directly go to the media or, or publish your own blog and, and and publicize it worldwide, uh, you might be attacked quite differently. And then, of course, it's always a question, who is your enemy? It's the difference between uh, a little uh, three, uh, three person firm or uh, the US military and, and the NSA. Um, there, there's a, a, a next coordinate is the, the revealing identity one. So, not every whistleblower, so that's, that's also a difference in, in definition. There are some people who restrict whistleblowing to going public. So a whistleblower is not only someone who publicly blows the whistle about something. While other definitions say no, it's, it's all also internal, because the internal process of going to your boss, talking uh, about wrongdoing with him, uh, would also be, uh, from procedural point, the same thing, same kind of action, same whistleblowing, as going public. So it's only a different addressee, and as I said, there can be many addressees. And you can also uh, go from one to the other, which i come to later. Um, revealing identity, that's the next uh, coordinate, so to say, they can distinguish between open uh, whistleblowing, so where I, I, I openly say, oh, it's me, and I complain about that, and confidential and anonymous. And confidential and anonymous are often mixed up. So from a theoretical point of view, confidentialist <coughs> means that there's only a few people to whom you have a sp uh, given a special trust, and perhaps they have a legal ob obligation, in the ideal case they have a legal ob obligation not to reveal your identity to someone else. It can be a man in the middle, which is between the addressee and you, who knows your identity, and then de or anonymizes it to give it to, to a third party. And anonymous means that besides you, no one, nobody should know your identity, and nobody should be able to trace it. And that's the, that's the other problem with anonymity. Uh, a lot of people think that it's very easy nowadays, and uh, with, with, if you have only the right tool, to, to blow the whistle anonymously. So this kind of tool normally will only assure one thing, that the communication between you and that tool isn't traced back to you. Um, it's great if there are tools who can provide that, and you always should ask uh, in how far, against who, uh, uh, against which enemy you are able to protect that enemy, anonymity. Perhaps you don't always need to worry about protection against NSA because NSA typically won't be your enemy in all cases. There might be some in which it is or in which uh, you, your enemy is able to, to, to get that information and ally with them. But uh, it's not always the case. But even if that works, the problem is that you need to provide the information. So all whistleblowing is about is providing information to someone from whom you expect to react somewhere. And this information will, will, will also carry information about you. This won't always mean that it will be able to trace it perfectly to you as a single person. So if there's a wrongdoing, 
witnessed by 100 or 300,000 people. Uh, you might have a chance, and they all have the same information, and, and nobody ever uh, complained about this thing on, on a private basis. Uh, then you have a, a, a good chance to disappear in the mess so that nobody is able to identify you. But uh, typically, in, in most of the little whistleblowing cases, at least that's not the case. Typically, you are in a very specific environment, you're a specialist in a, a very specific area, and typically, if you see a wrongdoing at your workplace, you're not, you're not, as an ethical person, you're not keeping silent about it at all. You typically raise questions, raise suspicions, try to speak to colleagues, perhaps uh, give some indications that you, you are not the one who, who really likes that. And if then you have an anonymous whistleblowing, which is perfectly working from the communication point of view, uh, there will still be uh, an assumption that you are the one who leaked the information. Being, that assumption being right or wrong. And the other fact we see is that it might be hard to stand it. So even if, if, if the information doesn't point back to you, if, you, if the communication worked well, what do you do if your story is in the media? And, and if, if, if people are asking you, uh, has it come from you or what do you think about it? Do you still manage to, to, to have a poker face and not to speak to anybody? I mean, that's what, what, what broke Manning's back, a neck. He, he spoke to someone he's, he assumed he can, he can trust to. And, and so he revealed his identity and, and that's what made him or her uh, end up in prison for 35 years. And uh, there's historically one whistleblower, this was Mark Feld, Deep Throat, who, who managed to, to, uh, to realize his identity only when, when dying several years later, 40 years later. Uh, but don't forget he was a trained uh, a security man. And uh, so he has had uh, capabilities most of the girls perhaps don't have. And you never know if, you're, if your uh, wife or, or someone in your family won't speak out about that if you spoke out uh, to her or him. Um, next point is understanding whistleblowers. So whistleblowing typically starts with a choice. And this choice is you see something. So the first thing is do you look most people don't come into the situation of being a whistleblower because when they, when they, they, they don't look closer. So when you ask them, have you seen that, they will always be able to say, no, I didn't see that. And there are other people who don't have a measurement system. Because to see something and to judge about it, that it could be a wrongdoing, you need to have a measurement system. You need to be aware of the law. You need to, be a, you need to have ethical standards against which you, you measure this is a violation of that, and that's something to react to. And, but let's say you, you have that, you, you saw something where, which could be wrong, then you still need to take a decision. Am I the one to do something about it, and what will I do about it? And uh, typically there are three different choices, which is in a situation where you can't act yourself. That's what, what whistleblowing is about. You can't fix the wrongdoing yourself. Neglect, exit, and voice. So if you can say, okay, it's not my business, or I better keep, keep my fingers away, I, I don't want to burn them. Or you could say, this is a system I don't want to be a part of anymore. I quit, I go to another department, I go to another job. Um, and neglect is also some kind of quitting. It's kind of quitting uh, with your emotional uh, willingness to, to identify yourself with this, with this organization typically. So if you have several neglects, you, you will distance yourself from your, from your, uh, from your uh, organization, which in German there's a term, in other words, So inner uh, distance. Uh, and, this, and the third choice is voice, and voice means whistleblowing in a way. So if you raise the, your voice and you say, there's something going wrong here. And that's what whistleblowing is about. Um, so why doesn't whistleblowing always take place? Essentially, there are three major hurdles. The first one is, is sociology. Social sociology, which indicates that people don't tend to, 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 to talk about to, uh, problems and they don't like it. They don't like to uh, criticize other people. Uh, we all want harmony. 
and uh, we all have one smooth living and, and no, no problems. Um, and, and if you know Milgram experiment, for example, or Stanford Prison experiment, then there's another uh, thing which is obedience to authority. So people tend to obe be obedient to authority, to follow the rules, to do what they've been said to do. And typically these people won't uh, come up as whistleblowers. Um, there's also these loyalty things which we learned that you shouldn't uh, become a denouncer to your to your to your to your mates, and um, typically loyalty is understood to be loyalty to a person. So don't hand someone in, uh, and not as loyalty to values. Why whistleblowers typically tend to be people that interpret the lo loyalty as a loyalty to values. And then they say, okay, this way has been violated, or there is a risk of violation, and so I don't, uh, I don't want to be silent about it. Um, the second issue, apart from uh, psychological things, is uh, do I have a chance to change? So what, what does it, it doesn't make sense to become a whistleblower if you don't think that you can change something about uh, with it. If you know that it's useless, if you know that your message wouldn't be listened to. So why becoming a whistleblower? And most people effectively think, uh, oh, I don't, I'm not the one to change the world, I'm not the one to change the system, it's not my business, so I, I don't even try. And the, and the third reason is uh, fear of retaliation. So fear of being heard when doing it. Um, typically whistleblowing runs in a five-step process. So in the first thing you need to be aware of the, of the, of the wrongdoing, and the second step, you need to take a decision be between neglect, accident and voice. And if you decide for voice, then you need to decide whom to address. And if you address uh, that person, then you, you enter into step four, which is you wait. So perhaps that's the most characteristic step of our whistleblower, you wait. It's not you to, to, to act, you can't change it, so you wait for the reaction of the addressee. And when you get that reaction, you need to analyze it. So am I happy with it? Problem fixed? Hallelujah. Or uh, the problem isn't fixed? And if the problem isn't fixed, then I, I'm back in, in step two, so to say. So I see a problem. What do I do about it? Do I go uh, neglect, exit, or voice? So, and if I decide for voice, then I go into the next round between two and four, uh, two and five for uh, becoming a whistleblower again. And typically this becoming a whistleblower again means that you, you raise up in, in, in hierarchy, you escalate. So first you have, and most people, over 90% of people first raise concerns internally. And even 80% of the people raise their concern even in the second round internally. So people tend to, to keep the level as low as possible. Um, and um, but you have, if, you, if you lost your first choice, so if you didn't manage to convince the, the first adversary that he should react, you have a problem. Because that means that you need to find someone who has more power than the one who neglected the problem and who said, no, I don't do anything about it. Or he even might have started already to attack you. So it's a, it's a power game. You need to find someone who's more powerful to support you and your issue to, to overrule the, the blockade and the no of the first uh, round. And he will all, of course, be an ally against you. So the, the one who already re rejected your proposal, don't expect him to, to, to be uh, supporting it in the next round. So you have another power, level, uh, power pool, so to say, against you when you go for the next level. And even on the first level, be aware that typically a problem isn't seen only by you. And uh, so the others might see it as an attack against them if you blow the whistle. If you blow the whistle, you also say, I saw it, you didn't see it, or you saw it as well, and you didn't react on it. And they might interpret that as a blame. And also people not being uh, the, the creators of the problems might, say, might see that, okay, this is a problem in my department, and someone might get the idea that I'm responsible for not fixing it or that I'm responsible for, uh, for not uh, blowing the whistle on it. 
So these are potential uh, allies of the other side as well. So you not need to find your, 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 your allies as well. You need to, to try to, to find proof for your allegations, bulletproof proof, and you need to find allies. So it's, it's much of a difference if you're on your own or if, you, if there's a group of whistleblowers. If you have solidarity from your, your uh, colleagues, or from, from unions and, and self-representations, or if you're on your own. Uh, but this concept of trying to, to form allies is of course as well a concept which runs counter anonymity. Being anonymous or trying to, 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 to act anonymously um, makes it very difficult to, to find allies. And you can't play an active role, you can't play an active role in legal proceedings either, if you are not identified. Um, what you also keep in mind, should keep in mind is that I think that most whistleblowers are not really uh, heroes of uh, civil courage. So most whistleblowers at the beginning of their journey don't see their whistleblowing as an oppositional act. Most whistleblowers think that their system they are working in and they are working for is a good system and that they will f easily find someone within their system to help them and to su support their just pace. They only later learn that the system isn't as it is described on paper. I was very astonished when I read a book about Asperger's syndrome, which is a kind of autism. Um, people with Asperger's syndrome t tend not to be able to read uh, social views so the, 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 between the lines, read between the lines. So they only follow the, the, what is on paper. And in the book, uh, which that didn't deal about whistleblowing at all, in, uh, in other parts, it was said that pe people with Asperger tend to, to, to take serious what is written down. So if there's written down, you shouldn't do it like that. They're the ones complaining about that. So they have a tendency or a high risk of, of becoming whistleblowers because other people knew, know what, that this is only a paper uh, format, it's a potential village, and nobody will really take it serious. Uh, you just need to, to talk to your colleagues on the couloir to, to know that, but they don't do that, so they, they don't get this message, message between the lines, and then they, by accident, become whistleblowers. Uh, whistleblowers. And this, this loyalty thing and this identification with the, with the own organization tends to change, of course, when you see the reactions. When they start acting against you, when they start ignoring the truth, then you you uh, come into different feelings and you need to decide if you go for several rounds and then it becomes a fight. And this fight might uh, ruin your life or change, it, change your life immediate, uh, enormously. And uh, then it's a, f a question how you come out of that fight. Um, Legal protections. Um, so for, for me, uh, whistleblower, and as well for the, for the European Court of Justice um, in, Lux in Strasbourg, human rights, um, whistleblowing is a fundamental right. It's part of uh, the Article 10 of the European Convention of Human Rights, which is uh, freedom of speech and opinion. And there have been several judgments meanwhile saying that this is the case. But uh, in this judgment, it is also said uh, that the, uh, there is a certain right of the uh, employer to expect your loyalty and that uh, there is a balancing process in the end. So not, not every restriction is forbidden uh, and you need to be truthfully and you, have, you need to have good motives as a whistleblower. And um, then the, the interest of you for free speech is balanced with the interests of uh, the employer of having a smoothly running business and uh, what, is, what is the difference between German law and, and European law uh, was that the uh, European Court of Human Rights also looked for the public interest while in the German uh, decisions which had been there before Heinrich case um, the um, German courts tend to say okay we, we just balance interest of the employer and interest of the employee and that typically was the employer who, who, who won and was said that uh, first you need to uh, go internally, only after internally didn't prove to be successful, you're allowed to go even to, to public uh, 
authorities and uh, only when public authorities, you try all levels, then you might be able to go to the media and to public, but typically you won't be allowed to do that from a legal point of view. Um, now we have a lot of discussions about having legal protections for whistleblowers. Uh, there are several levels where you could do that. Um, we have several forms of, of legal protections. The most common one might be labor law. So for example, in Great Britain, you have a, a Public Interest Disclosure Act, PETA, which is a labor law and assures that uh, a worker shouldn't be discriminated if he follows certain, certain uh, rules. And there, uh, there is a tendency to say you should go internally first, but there's no obligation. So uh, you, you might have a chance to, to get off with uh, going to a public authority directly. And uh, you, you should not be discriminated and you get uh, a right to damages if you are discriminated. Uh, the problem about this labor law approach is that it's only caring about one aspect of the whistleblower. So it's only caring about the security of the whistleblower aspect and that only with means of labor law. Means of labor laws are, are limited. For example, if you think about a little uh, budget and uh, you have a bad meat in this little bunch of fur, what will happen? Typically this firm will close because nobody wants to buy with a budget where, they, where, you, where it is known that they had uh, used bad meat. And what does it mean for your labor law protection? It's useless because you, you, uh, your enemy is gone. Your, your employers in insolvency uh, is bankrupt. There's no chance to get compensation from you. So and that's why we in our uh, law, which we proposed for Germany, uh, said that there should be a fund, a public fund with public money to, to uh, go exactly for these cases and to be able to pay damages for, for people really acting in the public interest. So it's a public interest in issue. Do we want to know about this budget? Do we want his employee to talk? Don't we want him to talk? If we want him to talk, we need to enable that he's also protected if he talks and loses his job because of it. And not only loses his job because uh, he's fired, but loses his job because the, the, the whole firm gets bankrupt. Um, and then you, you also need to see that uh, there's a difference between official and unofficial reactions. So in the good old days, um, the, 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 the companies really said, okay, you're fired because you went to the public prosecutor. So nowadays, a firm which is clever wouldn't say that. They would find other reasons. Or they won't even fire you. They, they, they would make their life uncomfortable with bossing and harassment and other things that would give you too much work, too much workload, and say, okay, you're fired because of incompetence. Or they wouldn't give you any work at all, and you fire you, 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 you cancel your job yourself because you can't stand it to sit uh, eight hours a day in an empty office with no window and, and nobody talking to you. Um, so this is really difficult, and so legal protection wouldn't always be uh, the, the, the only solution. Uh, what, what is really needed is a cultural change, is acceptance for whistleblowing, is looking at whistleblowing as a uh, kind of early warning system for all of us, as a kind of system which is very close to uh, innovative proposals. I mean, in, in most firms nowadays, we, uh, people can get, earn benefits from making innovation, pro innovative proposals for, for making the work better, workplace better and more, more, more profitable. And in a way, whistleblowing is the same thing. I mean, it's not a difference if I, if I raise an issue about a wrongdoing, which could also in the end, in the very end at least, harm the firm if it becomes public and, and from being uh, innovative in, in other respects. And then you need to look, and, and the, the other problem about labor law is, and legal protection is that it doesn't care about the subject. So the, 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 the key issue isn't solved. So you need authorities, public authorities, in my view, you need public authorities who do their job, who really are able to control and willing to control and, and prosecutors who, who really do their job and not say, okay, I, I listen to the, to the employee, uh, no, does he have facts? No, he doesn't. I ask the company, is there something wrong about it? The company will deny it, and then the public prosecutor is happy and closes the file. That's what often happens. 
Um, so there should also be rights in, in procedural aspects for whistleblowers. They should have a right to get a reasoned uh, reply to their, to their claim. So to their, to their complaint, they should get, get a timely and, and adapted and reasonable uh, reaction. And if they don't get, they should be able to, to, to force for that. And from, from these unofficial reactions, what is also important is that there should be a change of burden of proof. So you can't expect a whistleblower to prove that he has been, his rights have been violated and he, he didn't get a promotion because he blew the whistle, but it should be for the other side that if there is an assumption that there is any kind of connection between the whistleblowing and the, the deficits or the, the retaliations the person got, then it should be for the other side to prove that there was a justification for this uh, without uh, li being linked to whistleblowing. Uh, last thing which I put there is Boni. So in, in America you have uh, you can earn benefits as a whistleblower, and there we are in, in some cases talking about hundreds of billions, hundreds of millions of, of US dollar. Um, in in Europe there is a lot of cultural resistance to that, so uh, we don't want bounty bounty hunters. Um, but in in my opinion, there's, there's at least two aspects which we should think about. The first is that in our society, is, it is, uh, you might find it good or not, true that most of the things which, which aren't calculated in figures and in money figures don't, don't have any value. So it's important and it's a benefit of these U.S. laws that we are able to argue, for example, that the U.S. Uh, public uh, budget has earned uh, two billion dollar last year and three and a half billion dollar the year before thanks to whistleblowers. We don't have such figures in Europe. And the other issue about money is that bringing money and money for the whistleblowers into the game means that they are able to get professional support. So in, in, in Europe, a whistleblower trying to find a lawyer is, has a very difficult time because whistleblowers typically are not powerful, are not rich. And they, they have a, at least two issues. They have an employment issue typically, and they have the, the, the case issue because of which they went forward. And then it's very difficult to find a lawyer to be able to deal with them. And cases tend to be complicated. So it's part of the strategy of the other side to complicate cases, to split them up into different pieces. For example, in my case, there are 25 lawsuits and, and, and 20 or 40 complaints to the ombudsman. And uh, normally you won't be able to pay a lawyer with uh, 200 or, or even more euro per hour uh, to, to deal with all these nitty gritty details and which you need to deal with to be able to stand your case and to, to fight enemies like uh, very powerful institutions. And, and this uh, American system um, means that lawyers work on a, uh, on a on a basis of, of Borny themselves, so they don't earn a, any dollar if they don't win the case. So they will do a lot to win a case where they get 30% of a share of 100 million, that's for sure. And, and uh, a lawyer in Germany won't be able to win that, so he, 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 he won't perhaps be able to do that much for you, or he wouldn't, as, as an American lawyer might do if you are in a case which is related to False Claims Act or SEC. So finally, Whistleblower Network, we were founded in 2006. We tried to inform about whistleblowing, um, made several studies, um, supported some science projects, or at least a master thesis and bachelor thesis and things like that. We deal a lot with media requests, especially since um, Manning and Snowden came out. We try to, but it's very hard and, and almost <coughs> ineffective. Uh, to, to give uh, support in single cases because it's very complicated and uh, we don't have the, the, the infrastructure to do that. But we, we tend to, to uh, put people, uh, give people hints, general hints on our website, which is essentially don't, be, don't hesitate to, to look for, uh, for professional support. So as a whistleblower, typically you want to have a lawyer and you want to have a doctor on your side or at least some kind of psychological support. And you might want to have uh, union support, you might want to have political support, and you might want to have journalism support. 
So in, in, in the ideal world, you would have a team of these people working together with you for 10 years even, perhaps. But this is an, an ideal situation which is rarely found. I mean, even for, for, for Mollat, yesterday we had a, a, a public uh, meeting here where we had Mr. Schlotterer there. Uh, it took Mollat uh, six years or so, or five years, in kind of imprisonment in, in a psychological uh, treatment fa facility. Um, and he, he, he hadn't any sickness uh, and, uh, and he tried to, to address media and everybody and nobody cared. So it was only Mr. Schlotterer who, who then digged into the case and spent two and a half years of his life in, essentially in, in trying to get Mollet out of the situation. And without him he, he would still be in. And, and only after that, uh, and after very lucky events that they found documents from the other side proving his allegations. Uh, they, they, they managed to get built a big enough alliance and to get enough media support really to change something. So that's another thing, a visible belief, they, they think, so I tried all internal venues, I, I tried public authorities, they all failed, so now I go to the media and it'd be the, the scandal of the year and everything will change just like that. And typically they won't find the journalists to, to, to write a, a single line about their case. Because uh, journalists try to be very careful, there are only very few investigative journalists. They have their own agendas, they have areas which they deal with and others which they don't feel, uh, deal with. So not, you need to be able to make a match and you need to find a journalist who, who knows about that theme you try to get into the media and who is willing to do that, who has time to do that, and whom you personally can work with. And even if you find that, it won't help you to have the story in one paper once. That won't change anything normally. So you need to get a media wave, and that's a very hard thing to get. And it's a, a long-lasting thing. And even if you get it and you change something, you can't be sure that they just claim to change something, or they might even change the problem. But you, uh, nobody would still care about your, your personal situation. So the problem might be fixed, that's, that's something you achieve, but you still might be ruined from a personal and economical point of view. Uh, so it, it's, it's very difficult. And political lobbying is something we do as well. So we, we talked, about, uh, talked with all political parties in Germany. We managed to get three of them to, uh, to, get, uh, to make bills proposed bills in the parliament in the last session. Um, but I wonder, and they, of course they were all three oppositional parties, and I wonder if the Social Democrats still remember their own bill now, that they are in government and there are tendencies uh, that they will tend to forget about it. I mean, there's some international pro um, pressure as well on Germany. There was a commitment on G20 level that Germany would, or that all G20 states would, uh, as a measure against anti-corruption, uh, against corruption, uh, implement uh, effective whistleblower protection system and then the German government signed that commitment and afterwards they said yeah but we have that so and they don't have it and, and they've been found uh, of violating article 10 of the European Charter of Human Rights by the by the court in Strasbourg and they still say okay now now at least that problem is fixed because the, the judges will now take uh, into account that judgment, so no problem at all, nothing to do. That's at least the position of the Christian Democrats, and they even talk about whistleblowers being denounced. So we, we have an international network of, at, at the moment, five whistleblower organizations from the UK, Canada, Germany, South Africa, and uh, U, uh, USA, including a government accountability project in, in the USA who deals with with Snowden and his predecessors in the NSA was uh, at, at the bottom you find our web, <coughs> website, so please have a look. And uh, the Twitter account. So, and now, I didn't do what I was supposed to do, because I want to know what you always wanted to know about whistleblower, and I, the only one talking was me, so now it's time for your questions. If there are any. <laughs> Good parts by whistleblowing, but you were also talking about a lot of bad parts, and it could be 
bad for a person that does the list of work, but it can also be bad for a company. Do you think we should create an environment that allows for more whistleblowing in this? Yeah, I mean, we, we say we need more whistleblowing, but for, for, uh, we need more cultural acceptance of whistleblowing. We need more cultural acceptance of criticism and, and, and a completely different treatment of mistakes. So not look for blame, but look for solutions. And, and, and this is the root of it, but it's very hard to change that. And, and the first thing we should, in my view, from, from a legalist amyloid, so from a legalistic point of view, the first thing we should do is to have the state set clear legal signals to enable that culture. So in my opinion, it's a, it's a big scandal that there is any limit to uh, address public authorities. That's what they are there for. If the, if the state says, I have a monopoly of power, then he must listen. If he sets up rules and then he says, okay, but I don't listen if someone, I don't want to know if someone violates his rules. What are these rules good for and what is the state good for? So, uh, and then of course, if you have freedom of speech, then there should, should be freedom of speech. Okay, there might be limits. I don't want to be everything public and I don't want to have, be everything leaked. But at least uh, there should be an independent public authority supervising any other area. And there should be a parliament really caring about what, what governments do wrong and what um, public authorities do wrong. So I don't think media is a solution because in media that me, or public, it means you always really need to compete, compete with other. The, the human beings have only a limited range of interest. And they could put it on issue A or on issue B. And they can't put it on every issue. I can't dig into every whistleblowing problem in the world. And I don't want to do that. So we need to re regain hands on government and public authorities and assure that they take care. And it can't be a solution that people are forced to keep ins things in inside their public branch or inside their private uh, company and that they are supposed to solve the problem. I mean, I think it's fine if they care as well, if they want to hear, if a public, uh, if, if a company sets up a whistleblowing outline and says, please come to me and, and tell me, that's fine. And if they solve the problem, that's fine as well. But we need to, to be able for the whistleblower to always have the choice to escalate to public authorities and to say, okay, I had some trust in the company. No, I don't have trust anymore. Or I don't, having seen what they did with A, B, and C, I don't want to put any trust in my company. I want to go to the, to the public authority directly. One of the figures that uh, you have not mentioned between the pressure whistleblower is uh, this guy employee. Do you believe that uh, those disgruntled employees can be someone who is a pressure whistleblower or someone that won, uh, like, uh, in a sort of, uh, not revenge, but uh, unpleasantness about uh, his uh, previous treatment uh, when I come out from a job, uh, just start to be a uh, whistleblower? Do I want to care about that? Well, because uh, he's making uh, some data outside, because data can... Uh, no, I mean, but my line is, uh, that's a question of motives. So why do they blow it or why do they do something? And I don't want to care about motives. I want to, I want to care about people saying things which they know that isn't the truth. So for, uh, willfully lying, that's something which shouldn't be covered by any of these whistleblower protection laws. Hmm. But that's the only lie. I mean, just imagine you have uh, someone working in a nuclear facility and then he knows that there is an, a very dangerous situation which could lead to, to the, that facility exploding. So, but his motive for, for giving that information is not to, to save the people, but just to get a job of his superior because he betrayed his, him with his wife. So do I want to care about that or do I want to have the information? So of course, if there's, and, and there's laws for that already. I mean, at least in Germany, there's laws for defamation, there's laws for, 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 for giving falsified statements to public authorities and for all of that. So there's no need to, 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 to implement some legal changes there. So whoever willfully lies, we, we, be, we, we, we are able to punish it. It's, it's of course always difficult to prove, but that's another issue and that's the uh, assumption of, of, of innocence, which we, we don't want to give up, I suppose. And uh, after the talks of you this morning, 
I do believe that uh, uh, some kind of uh, booster loading platform uh, that can support externally the European Commissioner uh, working in some European uh, process uh, can help uh, to solve uh, some latent issues. I mean, the, the problem is that, that this, this, this uh, as I said, uh, putting your, your, your hopes into the public is, is very important. We need public scrutiny, we need journalism. It's very, very important. But it will only work in a very limited amount of problems. And, and, and I, I don't know if Europe is the way, uh, is, is a kind of problem that can be solved with, with that. Because uh, you have also this lang already this language issue. So uh, the European Commission doesn't need to care about a scandal in one or two member states. They simply can't. It's, it's only, they, they only get a problem if, if it's really in, in, in 5, 10 or, or 20, 20 member states. So, uh, and, and there is no European public, there is no European newspaper, there's, there's nothing. The, 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 it's all very dominated by national issues. And typically they, they just have um, prejudices about how Europe works. They don't know about details. You can't tell anybody my story because they won't be able to understand what Olaf and what Parliament and what, what the Commission and the rules and, and three courts and nobody would understand that from, from, from the public so you won't be able to, to move people. I mean, that's what, what we blame journalists for sometimes, that they, that they don't really talk about structural issues and about facts. Journalists try to, to, to sell emotions. They, they, they get people to react and to get people to to, to do something and to, to buy the newspaper, that's their aim. Uh, only if they touch them. And with these European issues, it's very, very hard to touch them. I mean, there might be some issues like, like data uh, issues or like the water issue, where you, where you, where you try to break it down and, and you, you, you can touch people. And you might be able to touch people if you have a story about prominent figures being caught in the act in, in, in corruption or child abuse or whatever. So there, there you have a chance to get uh, public attention. But from structural issues in, in, in public procurement, uh, like mine, uh, yes, good luck. I mean, I'm, I'm trying hard to, uh, if, you, if you know a journalist, no, write me about it, please tell me, please tell him about me or her about me. But up to now, I didn't find anybody. Got it, and uh, a question that is similar by your answer. Do you have in mind uh, some environment where uh, some kind of uh, secrets are kept and uh, there are no disclosure, there are no transparency, and there is no, there is no promoting the, of the solutions. I think that there are areas where you need secrecy, but I think you should implement a system where there is always at least one independent control. And you need to be sure that this is really independent, that the systems don't put together. For example, in the, in the Japanese uh, case of Fukushima, you could show that there were whistleblowers in the Japanese nuclear sector before, but that the nuclear control authority and the industry sector, they were closely linked together. So it was revolving doors from one to the others. And if you, if you bring one, a company and its in, in supervising authority uh, if they work for 10 years together, they will always link together and they will close, they will, they will establish their special links and they will trust each other and not outsiders and not whistleblowers coming with bad messages. So, for example, after a scandal like Fukushima, a good answer from the common society is to create an external whistleblowing entity that uh, uh, promotes and asks for whistleblower from both sides to look out. Uh, information in order to monitor the Yeah, but still then you would need to have enough expertise. So if you have one central authority for whistleblowers, like an ombudsman. No, no, not a central authority. Someone from the uh, society, from the community, from yeah. the internet. No, it's, it's always good to promote these ideas, and the more we have, the better it is. And uh, we, for me, there should be a, a, a rule as well in law that something which is a breach of law shouldn't be protected by law. I mean, there are areas where, if it's, uh, for example, a lawyer defending a criminal, there are areas where you need exceptions. So a lawyer shouldn't be allowed to, to uh, tell the true story of the one he's 
uh, there to defend. There, there should be limits, I think we agree on that. But in general, what, what Snowden and what Manning said, um, blowing the whistle on a crime can't be a crime. And, and that's an understanding we need to get. And there is, uh, for national security, there's something called Twartsy Principles, uh, which has been done by the uh, Open Society Institute. And that's a principle how you should, uh, it's very detailed, it's 50 principles with a lot of subtitles, uh, how, how to uh, be able to uh, uh, assemble interests of national security with uh, freedom of information. And they, they also tackle the issue of whistleblowing. And they say there always needs to be a public interest uh, rule that if it's in the public interest, it should be able to bring it to the public. But on the other hand, of course, it's something like public interest is something you can very much dispute about. In Germany, we now have a case with a minister, ex-minister, who also claimed to have acted in the public interest when disclosing a, a, a secret from, from public prosecution in a very strange case, by the way. Any other questions? Thank you very much. Thank you very much.